So obviously, each one of you know the importance of online reputation management because you're in the room right now, and it's so, so, so good. So what I'd really like to do is, first of all, before trying to dig into some questions, is open up the floor for anyone who's in here who'd like to get, uh, who'd like to lead off with the question, maybe, unless you'd like to lead off with your case study. What would work out best? Sure, oh, wow, introductions hit. Jump in the gun. Hi, I'm Justin Makula. I'm from the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area. I blog on justinmakula.com. I write about all things atheism, secularism, separation of church and state, and local news. I host a blog talk radio show, Brave Hero Radio, and the co-organizer and spokesperson of the NEPA Freethought Society, a local group for atheists, agnostics, and other secular individuals. Hi, I'm Lisa Santana. I'm the manager of digital media for PPL Corporation. Um, I have a team of about six people who work on our social media presence for PPL. That includes PPL Electric Utility. So if any of you are PPL customers, you should follow us so you can get updates on um, outage events and energy efficiency tips. But we also have um, Twitter and Facebook channels for some of our power plants. Um, and um, our community affairs department. Hi, I'm Megan Best, and I am the director of marketing for a law firm in Center Valley, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour and 20 minutes south of here in the Lehigh Valley. And I'm also a blogger on the side. My blog is called Lehigh Valley Transplant, and it's all about life in the Lehigh Valley and being a newcomer to the area. And so I'll talk, um, I'll talk both from a professional standpoint and a blogger standpoint today about um, what, what we do at um, the law firm as far as our reputation management and also what I've done on my blog and through our social media channels. Hi guys, well my name is John. Um, I'm a digital strategist and I'm just uh, making sure that everything goes smooth here and we get to as many questions as we can and I just give a presentation over there about outreach and what PR. So, um, but at any rate, I'd love to open it up and get any kind of questions from anyone uh, to get things going as far as that's concerned. Are there any questions that really stand out? Yeah. What sources do you use to find out what's being said about you online? Cool. So the question is what sources? Um, I'm sure everyone heard it. Does anyone like to jump on that in particular? I use a program called TweetDeck, which allows me to use multiple columns on Twitter. I add search terms for myself on there. If people mention my last name, my full name, or other keywords that I would be acquainted with or would be featured on. So I monitor what people are saying about me on TweetDeck, and I also use Google Analytics. So I get, email, I get well not Google Analytics, it's uh, Google, some sort of program on Google that gives me email alerts. Google alerts, that's it, that's right. Google alerts, so I get emails if people mention my name, and I also have a, a recent 24-hour Google search. You can go into Google search and change the filters to items that come up in the past 24 hours. Um, we use Hootsuite to manage our various channels because we have so many, and Hootsuite actually, it's similar to TweetDeck if you guys are similar with that, familiar with that, um, and it allows us to kind of have a dashboard where you can see all your different channels at once just to kind of monitor. Um, but what I really like about Hootsuite is that it also provides alerts. Um, so I don't have to be staring at a computer all day to see what people are saying. You get the alerts as they happen. We use Google Alerts. I also use um, Mention.net. I used to use Social Mention, but it stopped working. It's always kind of iffy. You never know when it's really going to work or not. Um, so I go to mention.net, you can put in search terms for um, your brand, um, you know, keywords that you want to follow, and it will show you in real time, not just on social media, but <coughs> the web in general, news sites, um, even broadcast. If it's online, they'll find it, and it also provides you the sentiment. So that's a great way that, you know, I use that tool daily. That also kind of sends, not real time, you can set it up to do real time, but because I get so many, I set it up so daily emails and they'll say, you know, you had 18 mentions today on this topic. Um, so that's a really good tool that I've recently just started using and I really like that. Cool. So uh, that's, did that answer your question? Is that helpful? Awesome. It seemed like uh, we started to allude a little bit about what the different channels that uh, you monitor, you said social and things like that. Would anyone like to talk a little bit more about um, some of the other channels to monitor? discussion boards and things of that nature. 
where else do you monitor aside from uh, social media? Well, over, over time, you blogging about some controversial items, you note that certain commenters will appear on your blogs or certain other blogs will start talking about you. So it's important, I think, to keep up on what other people are saying, to know what you might be doing, what they might be doing, saying about you, if you're concerned about those things. It's good to keep up on that. That way, when you might be blindsided by a certain accusation or some negative comments in some other spheres, you'd be prepared to respond to that. And sometimes you might want to respond to what other people are saying about you. You might want to reference their piece. You might want to write something else not mentioning the individual, deal with the topic, and just be done with it. You can also continue to pursue a certain topic or pursue what other people might be saying about you or just completely let it go. So you, when you use the Google program to find yourself, you use TweetDeck, you have the Google Alerts, you know that some people might be saying the same thing about you or making similar accusations or saying negative things. I don't, I don't really have anything to add. I kind of have the same sentiment. We monitor, and before PPL, as a very resource company, we're very you know, highly regulated, so we're very careful to get involved in social media. Um, what I was tasked with was just monitoring and you know showing our executives that, hey, this conversation is happening with or without us, so do you want to be a part of it? or? Um, do you want to kind of just stand back and let it happen? Um, the fact that you know, we started monitoring, we started seeing what people were saying, um, and now that we have a voice in that conversation, the tide has really turned. Um, we're able to, I guess um, I kind of call it like putting pennies in our um, goodwill bank because we we're able to have conversations with customers um, and conversations with our stakeholders on a positive note so then when we have an emergency or a crisis and something's going on, we already have this audience and we've built this goodwill with them. And you know we can talk to them honestly and transparently without kind of having that backlash. And when we do get the backlash, we'll see that um, people often come to our defense because we've been there all year long you know, building that goodwill. So one of the things that kind of came up when you guys were talking a little bit was that letting it go and also that response. Uh, I'd really love to hear your thoughts on, one, uh, when and how do you decide to let things go versus responding to them? And also, uh, equally important, is there a time, how quickly do you look to respond? I mean, that's more so focus for you from a company standpoint, but I'd love to hear a little bit about both of those parts as well. That's a great question, and I think, um, so my mom always told me to pick my battles. I thought that was really good advice, and I think it's really applicable in social media, too. Um, from a professional standpoint, obviously, I am responsible for the reputation of our uh, law firm. I'm also, rep I'm also representing our law firm in the community, and that also means the online community, so everything that I say is a reflection out of my employer. So some of the things that I'd like to say, I can't always say um, because I am representing the law firm, and we're also a very, obviously, rich diverse um, situation. And, um, you know, if you're a blogger and you have advertisers, you also have to keep that in mind, too, that, um, that your advertisers are on board with your, um, your tact in addressing any kind of reputation issues that go on, negative comments and that kind of thing. Um, I wanted to give two examples today, um, one of reputation management as marketing, and then also um, uh, some of the, the uh, uh, a lot of people have questions about what to do about negative comments when they come up. So the first is, um, we're pretty active on Twitter, some of our attorneys are too, and we observed that there was a conversation going on between some of our, um, our the folks in our business network. They were looking for an intellectual property lawyer, and the dialogue was, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I need an intellectual property attorney to advise me, are there any in the Lehigh Valley? And um, the folks in that uh, conversation on Twitter were saying um, there aren't any, there are no intellectual property attorneys in the Lehigh Valley, and you have to go to Philadelphia for those kinds of services, which it's just not true. Um, so from a marketing standpoint, you know, it wasn't necessarily somebody saying, um, you know, that our law firm is terrible. It was, um, 
an opportunity for us to um, observe that there was a need from, from a marketing standpoint. And, you know, we, there are intellectual property attorneys in the Lehigh Valley, so that's concerning for them, and that's their own reputation. So from that, we were able to, um, to build on that and to continue a conversation within our company, and we actually decided to hire an intellectual property attorney based on, on that and some other conversations. So that um, from now on, when we see that kind of conversation, we can say, hey, you know, we do actually have those services, and that's kind of cool. So that's um, online reputation management kind of marketing. I wanted to show you quickly um, a couple of comments that were made on a, a website uh, legal marketing websites, a lot of words, bear with me. This is um, lawyers.com, owns, it is owned by a company named um, Martindale Hubble. And on uh, lawyers.com and Martindale Hubble, you can go on, it's like Yelp for lawyers, and you can go on and you can review uh, your lawyer or the law firm that you um, have had an interaction with. And so we have a number of comments on here, we've been around for 25 years, and so, um, we noticed recently that there was this comment on our, um, on our on our site. I don't know if you can see, but I tried to circle in red. Um, we are a business law firm. We do um, real estate and healthcare, and you know a little bit of family law and estate planning. We do not do any criminal law whatsoever. So when we received this review from a private individual, number one, we don't service a lot of private individuals. It's mostly business owners, and that we have a client rating in the criminal law arena, we realized that there was something up here. So um, so I called up the folks at Lawyers.com at, um, at Martindale Hummel and I said, hey, we, you know, there's this comment here. It says the paralegal was very unresponsive. We wouldn't provide a documented um, bill for them. And that those are two things that we just have never really heard before. So we think that there's been an error here. Not to mention that we believe this is the review that falls under the criminal law area, and as you know, you know from our listing that we pay for, that you know we don't practice in that area. They were very defensive of their consumers, and I imagine that Yelp is probably defensive uh, too. You know, of course, law firms don't want a negative comment on a public site, on a third-party site about them. Um, and their response to us was, "Get busy soliciting positive reviews to, to counterbalance." Um, that review because we're not taking it down. <laughs> um, and, you know, we have to live with that, and so we certainly did that. Um, and, uh, you know, you can report abuse, there's a little flag there, and that's one option. Um, you know, if, if there's something written about you or your, your blog or your business on a, on a third party site. Um, so there are processes to, you know, to follow, but just know that sometimes the answer is going to be. You know, no, you have to kind of uh, balance the bad with the good. So, um, so that's in our business, um, that's what we decided to do. And so um, we actually explained to a couple of our clients, you know, we, um, we, have, uh, we have this comment on this website, and this is what it means to us, and this is what we would think happened. Um, you know, we know we are trusted clients of ours and we're trusted advisors of yours, and would you be willing to write about your experience on the site just so people kind of see you know, that there have been good positive experiences with our business, and they said they would. So there are a couple on here that are um, very specific. They call out some of the attorneys by name. You can see on this previous comment, you know, it's very generic. It doesn't appear that, um, you know, that they know us as well as some of these reviews. Highly recommend Tim, very responsive. They actually wrote kind of in, um, we didn't tell them what to write, but they wrote in response to that comment. Um, and, um, and we were very pleased with that. I mean, we, we take these review sites with a grain of salt overall, but that's kind of how we, um, how we decided to address this one. One of the things with the internet is that it could be a very wild west atmosphere, as we've heard earlier, in that anyone who owns a blog can basically make any accusation whatsoever, say negative things, and almost try to bait you into responding. So I think it really is important to pick your battles and consider what your focus might be. For me, some of my focuses are separation of church and state issues, wanting the government to be neutral in matters of religion and various activism in the area, writing about philosophy, philosophical topics. And if other issues come up, your blog might not be the best place to engage those topics because it can really distract from your core message or what your readers are generally 
used to. So consider before posting what your readers might want to be interested in, whether something is worth pursuing, and it's often good to take some time before posting, before writing anywhere on the internet. If you're very angry, if you're quite upset, it might be a good idea to just wait some time, reconsider, or even write a response and simply show it to a friend or just delete it on your own. So it's really easy to always think about online reputation management as a way to pivot when you see negative and these terrible reviews. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that would be really awesome is to hear a little bit more about the proactive side of it. So you mentioned, uh, Megan, that you, you've asked your past clients to leave reviews and things of that nature. Uh, how do you go about implementing a process for that? How does that uh, work and what are the benefits? Thank you. Well, um, it is a little different because we have a bricks and mortar type of business. So we do know our clients, we know the folks that we're asking to post um, comments about. So that does help and that may, um, how many of you all blog for your business? Just out of curiosity, this is just a couple of you. Okay, so, um, so I'll kind of tailor my, um, my response in that way. Um, we did, uh, reach out to specific um, clients and, and supporters of our blog, people that we know well. And sometimes that is more powerful than you know your own personal statements in response to something. So if there's something going on in your blog comment section, maybe your some of your readers haven't seen it and you know them and maybe you send them an email or you know a Facebook message and say, hey, would you mind like kind of backing me up on this? And it really does help, I think, when um, you know, when you have a third party kind of validate your, you know, your, your standpoint. Um, the one thing you do need to be careful about is um, uh, uh, posting anonymously or pretending to be someone else on your own blog um, in the comments section because um, those things can be found out and very savvy web users will, you know, will find you out. So you do, you know, you do need to be yourself and be your authentic self, in my opinion, um, on your blog. Um, you know, if there's a post that comes onto your blog that you don't agree with or you think is harassing or whatever, I mean, my blog is not a democracy, so I have the right to, to determine whether that is going to be posted live or, or be deleted. Um, I, you know, it really depends on the type of blog that you have, obviously, but, but in my case, you know, that's just not what I'm about. So. Um, so I can make those decisions. Um, I did want to point out that there is legislation going, there's a, a case right now in, um, in California regarding Yelp, and um, there is a, a business that had um, its employees post fake positive reviews on their Yelp site, and Yelp figured it out based on their IP addresses, um, and so they're suing them. Um, because Yelp wants to maintain its uh, positive, you know, uh, open site with um, honest reviews. They don't want people, you know, and Amazon has similar issues, um, with, especially with books. Um, so there is actually a case um, in, in the courts right now, and it's very concerning um, for a lot of businesses who maybe do have negative reviews on their, on their site and, and can't um, say much about it, but I would just caution anybody if you know if you're looking to improve your stats or kind of start a fight and not stand behind it. You definitely do want to be your authentic self and um, you know uh, and make sure that you're um, representing yourself in your statements. I just want to chime in a little bit that not all negative comments are a bad thing. Especially as a utility company, we get a lot of negative comments. We don't delete them, we don't hide them. We've actually had people send us private messages like, you know you can you know, stop people from posting on your wall, right? <laughs> yeah, we know. Um, we actually use those as learning experiences. We take them back to customer service. We try to get as much information as we can from those customers that have a complaint. Find out what that issue is, and when we come back, and resolve that issue for them, they usually come back to Twitter or Facebook or wherever and post a positive comment. And so people see that, hey, they actually listen, they you know responded. Sometimes people will just be ranting and raving and they just need someone, they just need to feel heard. And you know, we'll say, hey, what can we do for you? And they'll come back and say, you know what, this isn't something you can fix for me, but thank you for responding. So just knowing that we're listening is enough. So that we don't really hide from that negativity. 
Um, we do have, and one thing that is helpful for us is that we do have um, guidelines. We have community guidelines that are posted on our website, on our blogs, on our Facebook and our Twitter, like links to our disclaimer that tells people, hey, if you're using profanity, if you're, you know, upsetting the community for, you know, various reasons, you know, using profanity, racist comments or sexist comments and things like that, we have the right to take that down because, again, it's not really a democracy. Um, but if it's just a negative post about our business or an experience they had or some customer service interaction, we're not going to run and hide from that. But we do have some parameters in place to protect us. So, you know, if we do feel like, you know, this is getting out of hand, we can take that down. And we've done that in the past. It doesn't happen often, um, especially on Facebook, because your face is attached to your big, you know, your posts. Um, so people tend to not get too crazy on, on Facebook versus Twitter. Um, but we've taken them down, and then that person will come back like, oh, you're trying to hide from the truth. And we'll say, hey, you know, here's our policy. If you want to, like, you know, tell us what your issue is in a nice, productive way, we'll help you. Um, but we're not going to have you, you know, throwing F-bombs on our, on our Facebook page, which is open to the public. So I think having those guidelines in place helps us and protects us. But again, we don't, we use those negative comments because we use them as a learning experience. Um, during Hurricane Sandy last year, um, we were getting a lot of negative feedback about, you know, the frustration times. And so we could feed that back to the storm team and tell them, hey, this is what's going on. <coughs> This is what people are complaining about, and then they could, you know, kind of redirect their efforts and, um, you know, put more people on that aspect of storm restoration so that we could make a difference. So they, we were actually in the storm room so that they knew what was going on on social media. So that was really helpful, having those negative um, comments. I think that's an excellent thought in posting those guidelines because it is a discussion board. It's not a place to kind of have folks come out and, you know, for things to get ugly. It's meant to be constructive. In that, I agree with you. I would just address the issues that kind of come up that may be negative and show that you're being, you know, kind of, uh, that you're paying attention to what's being said and you're working toward a resolution. But those guidelines keep it from getting to a place that's just not appropriate. So I, I think that's an excellent thought and comment. Can you talk a little more as far as uh, what you use to outline those guidelines? Because that's something, um, you know, probably not a lot of people are aware of. How do you decide on guidelines? What are some of the things we, you're um, well, we work with our lawyers. <laughs> um, but we, as a utility, we're very actively involved um, with, you know, utility um, peers and, um, you know, we go to conferences. Um, so we know what best practices are. And so kind of like talking that out again, social media is kind of like the wild, wild west. It's still evolving. Um, but over time, we've all kind of found um, some guidelines that work for everyone. Um, and then just working with our lawyers, making sure that we're not violating anybody's right for, you know, to be free with their speech, so we don't want to do that. Um, but we want people <coughs> to do that. But our guidelines really are, I mean, we are, we want it to be open, we are transparent, but we want it to be a friendly place for our community members, because it is open to the public. So, you know, what if some kids stumble upon that? And we actually do get posts from kids who are like, you know, say thank you to the linemen or draw pictures of like, you know, polls or things like that. So we know that kids are on our Facebook and we don't want um, them seeing um, things like, you know, with profanity and things like that. So starting from there and then working with the lawyers to make sure we're not doing anything that violates anybody's rights, we just created this um, guideline for our community that we have on our website that people can reference if they have any questions about it. Um, are there any other questions or comments that anyone would really like to chime in on? Is that a hand up? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, this one's a little different, but I'm wondering if you have advice or opinions on um, the, the way that you use the internet as you personally, when you personally can be tied into your greater business. I know maybe you had mentioned that you kind of were always a representative of your company. Um, I work with a, a co-op in our area, and there's somebody on our board who on their own Facebook page, on the co-op page, they'll talk about how it's like so disgusting that people aren't eating organic, and they'll talk about like that is like horrible, like doing these negative things. And I really worry that things like that, while well, it's their own private right to do whatever they want, makes this organization look bad that they're representing. And so, I don't know. What would you do about that? <laughs> well, again, and again, coming from the utility where we're very 
policy driven and process driven, we have a policy in place for that and we educate our employees. Um, we have, and that's actually what I'm charged with at my job, so I had to develop a policy for our employees to know what to do and what not to do on social media. We provide them with annual training. Um, when new employees come on board, we say, hey, you know, you can talk about, you know, how great it is to work at PPL or, you know, what you did today. Don't disclose any information that's not public information because we are um, a public company. You know, you can't. And in terms of transparency, we cannot, and based on our policy and the lawyers, we can't stop someone from saying something negative about the company, but we can train them um, so that they know, hey, this could have a negative impact on the company's bottom line, which could negatively affect you. Um, but again, that training, having a policy in place so that you can go back to and refer to employees and say, um, you know, this is what you should and shouldn't do, Personally, because I'm in the communications department, I'm sometimes on TV representing the company, I'm sometimes quoted in the paper, people who follow me on Twitter know I work for PPL, they know what I do, and so they know my life is kind of intertwined. So it's a little different for me than it would be for just you know a regular employee. And so that education part of it for them is very important. But me personally, because people know what I do, I have a disclaimer in my bio, you know, I tweet for PPL, but this is my personal space, these tweets are my own. But again, I'm very careful about what I say. Um, my boss follows me, my boss follows me, everybody kind of knows that I'm on Twitter. So I'm very careful about what I say about work. Um, and I guess it helps when you love what you do because I love my company, so I'm a good cheerleader for my company. So, and if I didn't feel that way, I probably wouldn't say anything. So, but that's like my personal company. I think anytime you're working with volunteers, sometimes um, you don't need a policy until something comes up. And so, you know, that may be what you're talking about there. And I think, um, you know, in that type of organization, or even if you blog as a group, does anybody blog on a site with a bunch of other writers? You're out there. Okay, so that, you know, I've done that too. And it can be concerning sometimes when you're part of an organization or a blog where somebody writes something or says something and you're like, that's not my thing, you know and that could potentially be offensive to you or maybe just doesn't represent your views and it is uncomfortable. I think, you know, you do need to have that conversation with, with one another or with, you know, the host of the blog that you're posting on to say, you know what, you know, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that blog, you know, or I'm not com comfortable with that post and, you know, what are we going to do about it? So, you know, if it's really my problem, then I can say, you know what, I'm going to opt out and I'm not going to be a part of this site anymore. Or, you know, somebody who's the moderator is going to have to say to the writer or to um, the person who's posting, you know, that's, um, you may not realize it, but, you know, now that you're part of this organization, you're going to have to kind of, you know, play by the gr group's, you know, values and, and ethics, and, and that's not really what we're, you know, what we're about in founding a co-op together. Does that answer your question? No. Awesome. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions you'd like to uh, throw in? Or comments on this that I have? Cool. I got this. Sure, go for it. One, one thing that comes with the internet, I think, is some sort of tendency that people have to get hits. And some people will think that getting hits is the most important thing, and they'll do whatever it takes to get that, whether it be making an unsubstantiated rape allegation against a famous individual, whether it be just mouthing off against certain people, and just totally trashing other people. And it does get a very high amount of hits in many cases. And people will come to the defense of certain individuals, people will argue with them, and it can be blog drama and controversy that goes on for months. It's, it's a big temptation to have these public disagreements and public thrashing of other individuals, when in many cases, disagreements can be resolved by going off the list, by sending a person an email, by picking up the phone and having a conversation, or simply just ignoring it. But the temptation is there for many people to have these conversations and make them go public, but it's a very easy way to damage your own reputation. And looking very desperate as a blogger and reporting something that might not really be true or something that doesn't have evidence to back it up. So I, I would recommend that people set a really respectful tone on their blog, and if they disagree with someone, to talk about the issue at hand instead of attacking people or making these unrelated allegations to be ideas and. One thing 
we haven't really talked about yet is uh, online trolls. And I know that that's something that, um, that the two of you have experience with. Too. Oh. So um, a troll is somebody who anonymously is posting harassing comments or um, either on your blog or someplace else. Has anybody had any experience with this? Personal experience with trolls on your blog posting nasty stuff? Is anybody here a troll? You can go. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give an example here too, and then you all, you know, have have personal uh, experiences too. I know Jamie has. Um, you know, on, on my side, I did say it's not a democracy, but, you know, um, I write about my community, and so I assume, and I track through analytics, that the vast majority of people who are reading my blog are local people. These are people that I could, you know, run into at the giant. I mean, these are, you know, my, my neighbors, friends of friends in a lot of cases. So, you know, when someone trolls my site with negative comments, I assume that it's somebody that I know. <laughs> or have come across in real life. And I never take for granted that this person could be somebody that I know very well who could be pretending to be somebody else online or, you know, whatever. So, you know, that's that's just the nature of my blog and, and how I think um, our, you know, local community goes. So, you know, I really have to be very careful about that. Um, a few of the people who have a reputation for being trolls and who have kind of been outed, um, in that way are in um, court, you know, on a regular basis with the people that they are harassing both um, both online and in real life. I mean, don't think that it's only, you know, isolated to, to online posts. So um, you should be really careful about, you know, cyber stalking and um, Twitter harassment because there are laws that do protect um, you as an individual, you as a writer, you know, um, if you ever have any concerns about that. I mean, there are forums online where, where you can find information or, you know, or talk to a lawyer, sorry, um, about it, about your rights, because you should never feel scared or threatened um, on your own blog. People do not have, have the right to, to assassinate your character or harass you. Um, how you decide to address it is, is a personal decision, but you, you know, you definitely do um, have rights. So, um, on my blog, um, my, what it, and, the, the trolling situation that I had led me to moderate my comments. Um, so now my comments aren't posted in real time as they used to be. Because to me, it's just not worth it. Um, the timeliness of people's comments on my blog is not as important as um, as my own, my online reputation on the, the community that I foster on my blog. So I just made that decision, um, and I've never looked back. And, and frankly, I haven't had trolls since then. So. I, I think there can be legitimate cases of trolling online, but I also think that there's quite the moral panic surrounding trolling online that people go way too far. In many cases, I've considered, I've encountered people who said that if you include me in a tweet, it's harassment, you're stalking me, you're cyberbullying me, that if you put my conversations on Storify, that this is harassment. I think it's really ridiculous that if people are going to put content in a public place such as Twitter, such as Facebook, and people talk about it, it's public. People are going to talk about what you write. But some consider that to be harassment, as if they just put all disagreement and all criticism into a little box, that everyone is the same, everyone's a troll. I'd recommend that people not do this, not take those individuals seriously. It's, it's gone really far and really over the edge to a point where is that BBC Newsnight did a whole segment on it. And there's this program on Twitter where people put certain people on a list and create an app so that people can block individuals. And what this leads to then is suspending and banning of certain accounts. Because on Twitter, if so many people block you, their system will flag your account and even take it offline. So there's a lot of moral panic. I would think not to take it too seriously. And if there is a legitimate problem, a legitimate threat, get the police involved. Um, but these same people also say, oh, well, the police won't listen to us. No one will take it seriously. Well, that's a very good way not to be taken seriously. Some people don't realize that when they put things publicly, that they're held responsible for what they say. And then it's in writing, so they have proof to say that you said it. Like, oh, my account was hacked or this, that, or the other thing. But you, you know, like you don't have freedom of speech because then you're in, then you're subject to the world of public opinion. Okay. 
made. And that's actually a harsher truth than having to make fights and backlash that you might have experienced. Like, if you're like, okay, I have a bad review, this person says we're horrible people. I mean, to then, like you said, picking your battles, if you say, and then you like, see, I, then I would want to be like, well, why do you think I'm a horrible person? But then people don't, they forget that they are responsible and everybody knows who you are. Because these are such personal accounts. You have the right to say what you want, but your public opinion is more important than just what your personal thoughts are. And sometimes it's really not worth engaging with the negative criticism because some people on the internet really don't behave very rationally and their respect is very low in many circles as it seems to be, at least from what I've encountered, a group of people who continue the same tactics of everyone who disagrees with me hates women, they're racist, they're homophobic, they're this and that. When someone so as much said boo or someone said, for instance, well here are precautions that you can take to not be assaulted and maybe you could take a self-defense class and people get really upset about these suggestions and it's it's very absurd on the internet sometimes that I, I can only laugh about the nonsense that goes on but I've disengaged largely with many of these people as I figured they're just not worth my time and they've lost their reputation so as they speak they lose credibility and they continue to do so. In 2009, I first got involved in church state activism when I filed a complaint against an nativity scene at the Luzerne County Courthouse, as it was a standalone Christian display, and the nativity scene was eventually taken down. And it was around Christmas time, my Facebook page lit up like a Christmas tree with all sorts of notifications, messages, emails were coming in, and um, the public got pretty nasty. Where People were saying that I should be expelled from school. People went so far to contact the school and try to make that happen. There were some individuals who sent threats that said if I went to their dorm room, they would punch me in the face and F me up for Jesus. This happened. So I just simply put these emails out and made it known to the public that this is exactly is what's going on and this is unfair. So I wasn't maybe the best of it at the time, but today I frame issues differently and say, well, you know, here's my explanation for doing these things. It's not an attack on religious people and assault on religion. I explain the position and say that I stand for separation of church and state. I think that religion should be a personal decision and the government should not get involved with it. And over the years, with taking a more respectful approach to religious believers, that people have been really cool about that, where they would say, well, I disagree with you on issue A or B, but I agree with you here. I've even met with local pastors, had discussions, had debates, and it was very friendly. So I think it's important to be respectful with people when you're sharing controversial opinions. If you're not going to do that, then it's just going to be antagonistic, and people are going to fight back very uh, vociferously. But in some cases, you really can't control what is being said about you because, again, not all people will act very rationally, and some people will be very nasty. So perhaps you can let some of those things go. But if you set a respectful tone on your blog, on your Facebook, on your Twitter, and other areas, then you'll probably have more success with public outreach, people actually listening to you and making <coughs> friendships rather than having adversarial relationships. That was such a good question and a great response. I think we've talked a lot about managing our own online repu online reputations. We talked about managing that proactively, about responding to it, but also keep in mind too that um, what you write on your blog whether it's about a restaurant or about a product, it is um, contributing to someone else's online reputation. So if it's a small business owner and you don't like their restaurant and you put it out there to the universe, you've got to really own that and know that, that you may have to back that up, that um, somebody may call you out on it and say, hey, you know, this is a small business, they're trying to do what they, they can, or hey, I really like that sneaker, or I really like that band, and you, you know, you bash them. I mean, 
you need to keep in mind that everything that you are creating uniquely it contributes to your own online reputation, how people perceive you, and also if you're writing about others, about their, their reputation. So just be 